Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. Um, let's just give it a minute or two so that the room fills up quite a bit before we kick off. It's 9 a.m. in New York. Okay, the numbers are slowly creeping up. All right, it's 9.01, and in the interest of time, I'm going to kick us off, even as colleagues continue um, to join. All right. So once more, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. I'm Dr. Nkiruka Didigu. I'm the Senior Interagency Specialist at UNFPA. Um, and I am your moderator and facilitator for today's um, Knowledge Cafe on behalf of the IPPN Joint Support Team. So welcome, welcome to the 16th um, Knowledge Cafe of the Integrated Policy Practitioners Network um, of the IPPN. We, um, we hope this is not your first time with us, but if it is, we're very excited to have you all. We have a really interesting session that we have planned today, but before we jump right in, I'd like to give us a little bit of a reminder of what the IPPN is and then mention our housekeeping rules as usual. So the IPPN is a one-stop shop for integrated policy practitioners for you and I. It's a network that aims to link existing efforts on SDG integration across UN agencies, government partners and beyond, and enables cross-pollination and learning to enhance UN system-wide capability to practice and to deliver high-quality integrated policy support to countries and regions. The IPPN is a joint effort under the auspices of the former UN SDG task team on integrated policy support. It was launched in November of 2021 with nine founding agencies, including UNFPA. It's spearheaded by our colleagues at UNDP, and it's really open to everyone. It's open to the UN system. It's open to government partners. It's open to academia, think tanks, civil society, and the public at large. We like to share. We like to learn from each other. We like to hear about the realities on the ground and enrich our collective capabilities. Now, a little bit on housekeeping. Please keep your microphones muted. It's been almost three years of, of um, remote calls and, and meetings. So I think we're all familiar with Zoom capabilities and so on. Please note that the event is being recorded and the recording will be made available to everyone shortly after the session. As we go on, we want to keep this as interactive as possible. So please use the chat function, post your questions, your perspectives, your own thoughts, reactions, insights, learnings from your own work in the chat. And we will have a good amount of time for an interactive dialogue where you'll be able to ask questions, share your own reflections after we've heard from all of our speakers. Now, in this session today, we're going to reflect on strategies used by our peace and development advisors to facilitate coherence and strategic collaboration in UN conflict prevention efforts through integrated analysis, programmatic advice, partnerships, and the identification of strategic entry points for conflict prevention. That's really what we're going to be discussing today. And we have three keynote speakers who have a vast amount of experience individually and among the three of them. Our first speaker is Ms. Priska Kamungi. She's the National Peace and Development Officer in Kenya. Our second speaker is Mr. Mohammed Al Husseini. He's the Peace and Development Advisor for Chad, formerly for Haiti, and he'll be sharing perspectives from his time in Haiti. And last but not the least, by any means, is Ms. Dilrukshi Fonseca. She's the Regional Program Specialist Asia Pacific for the UNDP 
DPPA joint program for conflict prevention. Now, a little bit about the program before I hand over to the speakers. Now, this joint program is a cross pillar initiative that enhances UN support to national stakeholders in their efforts to prevent conflict and to sustain peace. Now, obviously, I don't need to mention how critical an initiative such as this is, given the situation in the world today. I think we're, we're experiencing a record number of conflicts and crises across the globe. Since the Second World War, the world has not seen this, this, um, this number, this scale. And it, it just underscores the relevance of the work that our colleagues are doing on the ground and the relevance of the discussion that we're trying to to have here today. And these conflicts are happening against the backdrop of multiple, what we're calling poly crises, um, where many parts of the world are still recovering from the impacts of the COVID pandemic. We all are facing in various ways, the existential crisis that is, the, that is climate change um, and, and development goals and aspirations are under siege. If you look at the most recent SGs, annual SDG progress report, you see that all of the SDGs are off track and we are, at the midpoint of the decade of action. So we really have a lot to do and we have a lot to learn. So a little bit more about this um, joint program. Since its inception in 2004, the program has grown from a small scale initiative that started out supporting five countries to what is now seen as a UN flagship program that engages and supports more than 80 countries. At the forefront of these efforts, there are a cadre of 130 peace and development advisors, PDAs, including six regional program specialists. And these colleagues are deployed across 70 countries or regional hubs and offices. Now they work at the nexus of peace and development and in some contexts also in humanitarian settings, our PDAs facilitate cross pillar integrated conflict analysis conflict sensitive and peace building programming. And by providing regular high quality multidimensional analyses, the PDAs enhance the UN's understanding of the drivers of peace and conflict. Integrated analysis often conducted in collaboration with different UN entities inform efforts to forge or strengthen partnerships and coordination for timely, inclusive and effective response. The PDAs also assist the UN system in developing and implementing integrated prevention strategies and responding to emerging and or ongoing complex political situations. So that, that's a lot. And it's really my privilege to be able to moderate this session for you. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first keynote speaker, Ms. Priska Kamungi, who's the National Peace and Development Officer in Kenya. Priska, you're welcome. It's wonderful to have you with us. You have the floor for the next seven minutes. Over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to share with you our experience on uh, cross, cross pillar collaboration and conflict prevention in Kenya. Uh, I'll ask you to move the slides, uh, please. And here, uh, as a uh, uh, Kiki has said the, the role of the PDA, the Peace and Development Advisor in any of the countries to which they are deployed is to lead in the analysis, uh, particularly political analysis and to advise on uh, strategic uh, and political entry points and sometimes ex exit points uh, for uh, situations that, uh, that are dealing with the conflict or which are in the process of preparing for for um, processes that uh, could could lead to, to to tensions arising. Now, in uh, the in what we do, we normally do shared analysis so that uh, I need to. Uh, we we have a shared analysis uh, between members of the UN agencies, as well as uh, partnerships with civil society organizations and think tanks and the private sector and religious leaders, all of which contribute to the shared uh, analysis. And within the UN in Kenya, we have established a process through which as many agencies as possible are involved in the analysis. 
And following that analysis, there is an agreed uh, uh, or a, a common position uh, by the UN agencies indicating uh, what is the, the true state of affairs. And out of that uh, kind of shared analysis, there is also the agreed priorities on what the UN in Kenya needs to do and uh, and uh, how this links to the programming work on the SDGs and uh, and the and uh, thematic focus of the agencies now i'm going to share some of these examples uh, with with the discussion on the prevention platform uh, which we did uh, over the last uh, 3 years and then an, an election coordination work that we did during the 2022 elections uh, next uh, slide, please. Now, the prevention platform is uh, is shared by is is co-chaired by the Peace and Development Advisor and the Human Rights Advisor, and it is convened uh, every quarter uh, and brings together the RCO. I mean, all the co uh, uh, functions in the RCO as well as 16 UN agencies uh, which lead various thematic areas of the multidimensional risk analysis that is uh, that is on the right here of the of the uh, slide uh, and it it it, it uh, the agencies lead uh, the analysis depending on their mandate and uh, and uh, programmatic uh, collaboration uh, aspects. So, for example, if you look at uh, uh, the Peace and Development Advisor, the Peace and Development Advisor leads uh, on issues of political stability and regional and global uh, influences. And uh, UN Women will lead on gender equality. And uh, UNEP will lead on environment and uh, climate related issues and uh, WFP on food and security and agriculture with FAO. So sometimes you see that where, where else we have just one agency that is leading a, a particular issue, there are some that are cross pillar and are usually led by more than one. Uh, for example, if you see uh, social cohesion, equality and discrimination that is led by uh, several agencies and together they come to uh, to to collaborate to show uh, what the issues are in that particular uh, uh, the, that particular theme or the risk area and uh, they come up with a, 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 a with some recommendations on what needs to to be done so the in uh, Kenya we have uh, quite a strong uh, partnership with the uh, with the uh, civil society groups as well as with think tanks and with this uh, prevention platform we have uh, members that are selected by heads of agencies as focal points who are pen holders to the prevention platform and the we we see that uh, the platform brings together all the areas of the uh, HDP nexus and each of them is also supposed to uh, to focus on a particular uh, development goal and also to provide uh, data. Uh, next slide please. Uh, so I'm going to share with you an example of some of these reports that we produce uh, and uh, here is one uh, such report and I'd like you to ask you please to uh the, the first page uh and we see here this is the a report that is produced by these 16 agencies and uh, this was for the quarter at april to june 2022 and it looked at the risk and vulnerability across the the 13 risk areas so the agencies come together and share the report uh, or the analysis, and then this is mapped uh, on the uh, on on a map like this one. And then we see what are the primary issues of concern. And uh, if you look at the arrow, it, it shows which ones are getting worse, or which ones are stable, or which ones are improving. 
and uh, that is the, 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 the we we do this kind of analysis for all the 13 areas so if you could uh, please uh, highlight one of the areas so for example if you look at the human rights and the rule of law and democratic uh, 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 rule of law dem democratic and civic space and fundamental freedom so we see here we see what has been happening over time uh, and we see that these three issues on uh, human rights uh, defenders being arrested and uh, the question of the media these three first points were on a downward trend they were getting worse but the issue of police violence and accountability was improving and you see that they are looking at STD 16 and uh, 17 and on the right where you uh, you have the outlook for the next quarter you see the opportunities of what could be done for example here they are talking about concluding <clears throat> the observations by the experts on the, the that cycle of the review and then they are also talking about what needs to be done including uh, deployments of human rights monitors and then there are risks uh, of what could uh, happen in the next quarter that needs to like highlight what the the next area of uh, no. of uh, focus for the next quarter and what everyone in the prevention platform that is the whole of the UN needs to pay attention to this risk uh, that's coming up and in this case it was the question of human rights defenders uh, during the elections and uh, the continued risk of uh, restrictions to journalists so sometimes and this is something that uh, we uh, all the areas uh, or, or the risk areas uh, focused on this kind of uh, uh, analysis so if you could look at the the last uh, page uh, please and here we see that there was, there's a lot of uh, use of data uh, to show uh, uh, to show the the trend over time and this data was released from uh, the UNDP uh, crisis dashboard and also for complemented by uh, agencies that are supported by the UN that were working on uh, what that were required to provide data. For example, we had data that is uh, uh, disaggregated by gender and age and also uh, the reporting uh, had to always include the perspectives of, of uh, men and women and uh, the young people. So I think I'll stop there in the interest of time and go to the next slide, please, very quickly. And uh, I'll highlight here the work that we did on uh, election coordination for early warning during the 2022 elections. And this is uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, intervention, we the, the PDA uh, worked very closely with the, the resident coordinator to bring together all the agencies that were working on elections, uh, peace and security, and uh, focal points from all UN agencies, and we formed a task force on elections, which brought together uh, all these agencies and established very strong partnerships with the external actors. Uh, 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 and uh, all the agencies and the civil society groups to do continuous monitoring of the situation. Uh, we established uh, situation rooms both within the UN and uh, in some of the ministries and uh, for uh, and in collaboration with the with the with the religious leaders. And also provided analysis that was coming from these uh, interventions or this continuous monitoring uh, to 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 the international observers and the national observers, and also the 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 UN itself. And we also had the interventions that were informed by this analysis to guide prevention and uh, preventive di diplomacy uh, efforts. Uh, for example, through the establishment of the mediation teams, the Women Mediation Network and the National Peace and Mediation Team, 
and we also provided this for the office of the uh, special envoy for the Great Lakes, of not uh, Horn of Africa region. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the some of the examples of the reports uh, that uh, were not as were focused on the elections. This one was looking at what the youth think. And the other one was, uh, pro which was produced uh, every month, it was about the social media monitoring of hate speech and incitement during the elections. So we find that uh, there is the integrated analysis that uh, we did for all the areas of, of focus uh, based on the multidimensional risk framework, uh, bringing together all the agencies and there was thematic uh, uh, analysis for example, this one on elections. There were other forms of uh, uh, analysis that was done, but for now, I think we'll stop there for, with these two. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Priska. I mean, I was I, I, I needed to stop you, but you stopped just as I was about to interrupt. And, and I'm glad I didn't have to because that was really so interesting and so relevant. And we can see you're doing a lot on the ground. We're going to come back to you in the interactive when we have more specific questions. I'm sure the participants have a lot of questions for you. Now, let's move from Africa, move from Kenya over to Latin America and the Caribbean, where Mohammed Ag Al Husseini, who's the Peace and Development Advisor now in Chad, but formerly in Haiti, will share some perspectives from his time in Haiti. Mohammed, I'm gonna crave your indulgence. You do have seven minutes. Please try to keep to the time so we can make the most of our time together. You have the floor. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you, Kiki. And uh, uh, thanks to Priska for the, her presentation. Uh, also, thanks to the colleagues who, are, who, are, who have uh, interest in following us here. Uh, first of all, I think Kiki flagged a concept that is very interesting when we, 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 we speak about Haiti, which is polycrisis. I think this is, uh, I, I can uh, affirm that Haiti could be an icon of polycrisis because it's a country where we, we have interlinked crisis and each crisis is fueling each other, the other one. So you, for example, we, in 21, we, we experienced an earthquake in August. And when we were responding to the situation, to the, to the humanitarian crisis that resulted from this earthquake, all the roads were blocked because of the armed gangs because they are controlling several roads and it was difficult to read to, to, to the populations in the, and, uh, and those in, in need. And at the same time, it was a very big challenge to deal with the gang situation because of the governments and governance and stability that resulted from the assassination of the president. So I think this will just give you an idea on, on what's, what is Haiti in terms of crisis these interlinkages of, of crisis. But my presentation will focus mostly on, uh, or I will try to, charge. to reflect. De quel context parlez-vous? Francis. Yeah, I will, I will try to reflect uh, how the integration have been operationalized when I arrived there with the support of the RC, which is also the deputy representative of the Secretary General. This is the other particularity of being PDA in Haiti, because uh, it was one of the rare PDA positions in mission setting. So the resident coordinator is the deputy representative of the secretary general. And that means that we have a mission there. It's a political mission, really. Uh, so we have a kind of, has PDA, I, 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 I had a, a kind of matrix reporting line, of course, as most of the PDA, RR and the RC, but in Haiti, we have a third person, which is the head of the political affairs section. So that's, uh, I think it's important to know that. And I think in addition to the classical role of PDAs in other countries, the, the facilitation and the role that the PDA would, was a kind of bridge between the mission and the RC office and then the UN country team 
was very important to reflect how the role I will explain uh, look, looks like. So ne next, please. And uh, I, I will quickly just focus on five points. Uh, what, what is the strategic framework in Haiti, the role I played as PDA, and how this was reflected in the joined up approaches we, we set it up, and some of them were there or before, and uh, the challenges, and of course, the opportunities we have as the UN in this kind of uh, settings. Next, please. So here I'll just uh, mention that we, from the first year I arrived there, we moved from the ISF, the ISF, which is the, the integrated strategic framework for the mission, the UN mission, because the, the SRSG is the most ranking UN official in Haiti. So, and, and we need due to the political, primacy or primacy of political within the UN, we need to be aligned to the ISF from the mission. And at the same time, conversation started uh, on the, the, the cooperation framework, the UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework. So what we, we did first is to see how we can, uh, I mean, reconsider the mission priorities because they are mandated priorities. We, we cannot change them and to see how we can align them with the dynamics in Haiti, because it's every day you, we have a new situation to, to deal with. But in the meantime, we methodologically, as PDA, I tried also to explain and to keep sensitizing colleagues and the leadership that we should not plan uh, based on the events, but, or, but mostly based on the drivers of the instability. And, and Thankfully, uh, Bruno Lemarquis was there and he, he had this concept of near Gordien. I think I will, I will raise it, uh, I will flag it in the next slide, which is mostly uh, what we consider as the structural drivers of instability. So we try to focus our work on that and based on that to readjust, uh, not to readjust, but at least to, to ensure that some of the priorities will cover uh, the, the emerging challenges, the ongoing challenges, but also the structural drivers of instability in, uh, in Haiti. Uh, so, and when we started this conversation on the UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework, we, we used what we have in terms of what we have as mandated objectives of the mission. And we tried to have to inform them with the CCA. And that's, uh, that's where we, we tried to have an, an innovative CCA when we, we reflected the historical construction of the instability in Haiti. I think this, this was the, the, the critical juncture and on how we did the analysis, the common country analysis, to try to reflect the structural drivers of instability and now to have uh, strategic result in the cooperation framework that covers or that may pro provide the UN this space and the logical framework to tackle the, the structural drivers of instability in the country. Next, please. Uh, and then you can imagine that the I, as PDA, I, I played this role of integration also between the mission and the UN country team because for the RC office, yes, they need to go, of course, through the, to the, the DCO guidelines and some of the, the benchmarks and the inspiring uh, examples they have are from countries non, with non-mission settings, if I can say it like this. But, and the other challenge for the political affairs and the political mission is that we have a mandate from the Security Council everything we, we should do in Haiti should be aligned to the benchmarks we have from the Security Council. So and I think this is where I tried also to play this third party role to reconcile the perspectives and to see how we can align what we have in terms of uh, ambition as the RC office and the UN country team to align it with the, the, the mandates the UN has in Haiti has uh, a political mission mandated by the Security Council. And I think this is where this uh, 
matrix reporting line also helped me because I'm attending meetings from the, the political mission and meetings of the political affairs section because I have a reporting line with the political chief of the political affairs. And at the same time, my, my direct chief is the DSRSG, which is also the RC and the, the humanitarian coordinator. So I think this, this helped also uh, to, to create alignment, but also coherence in our effort. Because one, one important example was the, for example, this benchmark one priority one three, which were focused on civic dialogue. When I arrived, I tried to negotiate to have it tailored as a benchmark we can use to build national peace infrastructure, which is very key when it comes to build national capacities for conflict prevention. So I think uh, that was uh, a good achievement because the senior leadership accepted that this, this benchmark priority 1.3 will be uh, led by the PDA on behalf of the mission and uh, the, the UN country team. So I think this was a good point because I have at least, I had at least seven agencies, including the mission, in a group where we, 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 we developed and we, 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 we conducted some, I can say, small research and field work and to, to build analysis and, and reconstruct the UN offer in terms of uh, civic dialogue in general, but also in, at the same time building the national peace infrastructure. So I think this was very important, this nodal uh, role I played between the mission and the UN country team also helped to build this coherence uh, and the adaptation also of what we have because in 2021, we, we had, after the assassination of the president, we had several dialogue tracks. And I think this helped the mission to keep playing its uh, good offices role. And at the same time, on the UN country team level, we tried to offer a kind of programmatic response to that. And this is where has PDA, I, I, I negotiated with the RC because I have also the chance to lead to provide the technical leadership to the peace building fund secretariat. And then we developed a, a peace building projects on national peace infrastructure. So to support what has been uh, done at this moment in terms of good offices and uh, facilitation from the SRSG uh, to support it with a peace building projects in terms of um, uh, concrete for the citizens. This is more concrete than uh, political talks. So I think this helped to build confidence somehow in the mission, but also to lay the basis for a programmatic response. And because we asked the involved agencies to, to also, it was a kind of requirement uh, or yes, condition that they will use the PDA project as a catalytic project, but they will then have this priority in their country uh, development uh, programs, their country programs, CPDs. So this oh, is the, 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 I hate to jump in, but if you could wrap up in one minute, please, that would be great. Yes, sure. <laughs> yeah. So I think, uh, uh, please, next, I will just uh, yeah finish on the next uh, slide. Okay. So then from here, I think we 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 really try to to develop the offer we have, uh, having in mind the structural drivers of the instability, but also the emerging uh, uh, challenges. And this is what we, this is where we tried also to improve the offer in terms of community violence reduction. For example, in on this thematic, the mission was very uh, a hard and operational perspective, like in peacekeeping mission, because Haiti, we, we, we had 20 years of peacekeeping missions before the political mission and colleagues working on the thematic. Of course, it's, it's important to have this uh, perspective of operational response to, to counter uh, community violence. And this is where has the country team, we try to bring a prevention perspective in this work to have a kind of territorial, um, uh, how I can say it, uh, territorial approach. So in some places we need to respond, but in the other ones we need to prevent. So this is uh, the way we, we use for many of the thematics to build our, our response. So I will stop here and I will be happy to, 
to 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 keep standing on the on the Thank you so much, Mohammed. That was just so interesting, so captivating. Honestly, the situation in Haiti is a very unique one. We understand that. And so we appreciate you taking your time to explain to us sort of the structure that you navigated, what you met on the ground, what you had to create, how you were this strategic uh, integrator. Very interesting. I think in the dialogue session, we would like to hear a bit more about challenges and opportunities, and I'm sure colleagues have questions. Let me move over very quickly now to our final keynote speaker. Um, we're moving away from Latin America and the Caribbean region and going to the Asia Pacific region where Dilrukshi Fonseca, who is the Regional Program Specialist, Asia Pacific, UNDP, DPPA, will share some perspectives with us. Dilrukshi, I plead with you seven minutes. Thank you, over. Sure. Thank you, Kiki. Um, so because of my regional specialist role, my reflections will be somewhat different from both Priska and Mohammed. But I'm hoping that in some of the observations and examples that I share, that you will also have a flavor of what all six regional program specialists deployed by the joint program do. Um, and I will try to combine the observations with examples and make uh, three key points. Um, so the brief that was given to us was to reflect a little bit both on how uh, PDAs facilitate coherence and strategic collaboration, and also what context-specific conflict prevention looks like. Um, I think one of the key ways, and Pris both Priska and Mohammed alluded to it with examples, is applying a conflict lens into UN planning, whether that's the standalone conflict analysis and regular context monitoring that PDAs do, but also how we kind of really ensure that UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Frameworks, agency country programs, have a conflict lens. Um, as the regional specialist in a, in a region that actually only has 11 countries with country-based PDAs, I'm often called upon to provide that service upfront to those countries that either don't have the dedicated in-house capacities by way of either a PDA or within the agencies to help to do a conflict analysis or to integrate a conflict analysis. Um, but also with the UN reforms, we now have a more kind of uh, formalized architecture in place for the quality assurance that the cooperation frameworks undergo at regional level. And, and I sit as a member of that quality assurance group to make sure there is a good enough, I would say, reflection of peace and conflict issues, not just the risks, um, but also the opportunities in the way uh, we do a common country analysis. Um, I say, I think this is a really strategic entry point for facilitating coherence because it's as much about the substance that goes into these documents, um, but also really about the processes that PDAs and others are able then to facilitate to have those conversations and to build that kind of consensus within a UNCT um, on peace and conflict issues. And, and as regional specialists, we also tend to look at some of those products like the common country analysis to look at whether cross-border and regional issues are adequately reflected. So that would be, I think, one strategic opportunity for facilitating coherence, both substantively um, but but also in terms of the process and the conversations. The second example or point that I would really like to share, and it's something again as regional specialists we do, is facilitating a regional analysis, um, a thematic but but also geographic. Um, Priska already talked about a crisis risk dashboard. Um, uh, we very recently set up a Asia Pacific 
a crisis risk dashboard. And for those of you who are not familiar, it's a risk visualization platform that has been developed by the UNDP Crisis Bureau. And starting this year, we, we have a regional CRD, as do several of my fellow regional specialists. And we also put out a quarterly risk monitor um, that analyzes a sample of risks. For me, this is a second strategic opportunity for facilitating collaboration and coherence, and that happens in a couple of ways. One is really helping to apply a multidimensional lens to data and analysis, not just a peace and security lens. We've talked already about a polycrisis. Increasingly, these are not standalone risks, nor are their impacts uh, siloed. So really looking at a sample of risks that maybe um, on the surface don't have connections, but trying to look at the connections and to see whether there is a story. The first quarterly risk monitor that we did for Asia and the Pacific sampled both inflation and protest data for the region um, to, to see what kind of story that told. Um, dashboards, data, evidence, these are all means to an end. Uh, they, they're certainly not the end. And I think they are only as good as um, who you bring around the process, um, but also who you bring around its products. Uh, the regional CRD for Asia and the Pacific uh, was prototyped in collaboration with regional colleagues from UNDP, DPPA, OHCHR, and DCO, including financially. And with the risk monitors, we are testing an approach where one entity leads um, on the quarterly risk monitor. So for the next quarter, for example, we have OHCHR in the lead looking at civic space in the region. Later this year, we've just started work also um, with a, a think tank in the region to map key transboundary conflict risks and their implications for development. Um, and this is, again, another opportunity. A lot of uh, the UN's programmatic frameworks, et cetera, seem to be are very national in, in the way that we are set up. And sometimes there is a risk that we lose sight a little bit of some of the more transboundary thematic conflict risks in, in our regions. So I'm hoping and watch this space that this will be another entry point and opportunity to facilitate coherence around conflict prevention. And maybe the third example is um, uh, now focusing a little bit more thematically. Um, over the last year and a half, um, I facilitated a five country community of practice on, on hate speech with members drawn from different agencies um, at HQ as well as country level looking at the prevalence of hate speech, which is uh, an emerging and, and evolving uh, conflict risk, uh, both bringing a substantive lens. So, you know, we'll look at monitoring and evaluation. Um, we'll look at engagement around elections, et cetera, but also institutionally, how different agencies approach and program around the issues and drawing from good practice from the region and elsewhere. This is a, a third opportunity, and here we talk, talk about context-specific conflict prevention, where, you know, as a regional specialist, we look at what some of the prevalent uh, uh, conflict risk priorities are for the region and really try to look at strengthening the practice uh, around these issues. Um, uh, late last year, we had, I would say, a, a meso level a policy engagement with tech and social media companies, and we did it off the radar, um, really having a substantive discussion. Um, and this was really appreciated because the PDAs bring very context-informed approaches 
to issues like like hate speech. Um, and, and there's been a request now from at least one of the companies to do further deep dives and, and, and to regular regularize this. Um, so here that that example for me is a little bit how country-based PDAs, but also the regional specialists also work on kind of uh, thematic priorities for the region and for their countries and kind of facilitate very context-driven uh, approaches to, to working on those. In the interest of time, Kiki, I will stop there, but I'm really open to take any questions and to join in the discussion. Dilrukshi, thank you so much. That was so interesting and complimentary to hear from the regional perspective, the kind of work that you guys are doing. So interesting. This last point you made about hate speech and then, you know, pol um, political unrest or that sort of thing. I'm based in New York. It had me thinking about what we saw happening around the last election that led to the January 6th insurrection in Washington DC. So it's, it's, it's almost like a global trend. And it's so interesting that you guys are looking across different um, risk samples that may look unrelated, but then when you analyze and you look below the surface, there may be some correlation. So very fascinating work. Guys, we do not have a lot of time. I had promised that, but to our audience that we would have sufficient time for interaction. We are monitoring the chat. And I want to encourage you to use it and put in your questions. Um, we're moving to the interactive segment. So if you do have a question, if you want to take the floor, please uh, raise your hand using that function or turn on your camera. I'm going to look through at all of the little black boxes on my screen. I do see a few lovely photos, but not enough faces. Feel free to turn on your camera, please. Um, but to kick off the interactive discussion, I have a few, I have two questions for the three of you, really. Um, in the work that you're doing in your respective country and regional context, what have you found most challenging when supporting cross-pillar collaboration? Um, so at the country level in Kenya and Haiti and at the regional level for the Asia, Asia Pacific, what was the biggest challenge? And then secondly, this is more a UNCT focused question. How do you bring the UNCT together in support of integrated prevention strategies? I think Mohammed actually started speaking to this in his role as a strategic integrator, but we want to hear more about the challenges. Um, colleagues, before I hand it back to our speakers, I just want to make sure there's no question coming from the floor. I do not see one. Okay, so so guys, you have those two questions to chew on. I'm going to crave your indulgence. Please, no more than two minute responses, so we can take a second round of questions, and maybe we'll start. We'll we'll move things around, and, and we'll say gentlemen first. So, Mohammed, you you have first shot at responding. Over. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think the most challenging aspect. Uh, was of course navigating those complexities because complexities of the context, but also complexities of the leadership when, because a PDA has at least two supervisors from diff two different entities, RCO and sometimes DSRSD and the RR. And when they become three, you have also the mission with its, uh, its own leadership and requirements and ways of thinking and ways of being the UN. So I think this is the most challenging because sometimes the PDA depends on the leadership style. I think even if you have very nice ideas, you are very motivated. Uh, if there is, uh, you, need, you need this complicity with your leadership to, to go forward. Just in the interest of the time, I will go on the second question, I think, on the, for the UN country team. I think this is where we, we sometime, what I, uh, I, I noticed after one PDA experience before Haiti, that sometimes you need to have some fundings. Of course, you can come to the UN country team and, and talk about conflict sensitivity, conflict sensitive approaches, maybe sharing nice data and figures, but if you don't have something 
that they are interested in, it will be difficult to keep them on board on the long term. So this is why when I arrived in Haiti, maybe the, the joint program colleagues can <laughs> confirm. First, I asked to have uh, uh, at least the double of what I used to have in Mauritania as PDA uh, in terms of the catalytic funding. Because I know that when I have it, I can also negotiate with the agencies to do something together or at least to offer something and mm -hmm. then push them to build on that. And the other aspect, I think the, I did this experience first in Haiti is using the peace building fund. This is what I, I did when they, they, on behalf of the leadership, they gave me the, the technical lead of the benchmark one, priority one, three. So I also asked, I also, I mean, not asked, but just justified through, this, through the analysis that we need to do something on that in terms of peace building. And then we aligned it the strategic and political offer we have in terms of civic dialogue and good offices towards prevention and at the same time offering something more concrete for our national partners has a peace building project. And we did it and I think it was a very interesting uh, experience. Yeah. Thank Over. you, Mohammed. Very yeah. practical, very real um, responses. We appreciate that. Priska, those same questions, the biggest challenge and then what you were able to do to integrate or to have some integration at the UNCT level. Two minutes, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for us in Kenya, I think the greatest uh, uh, challenge uh, for this, for putting together the prevention platform was the siloed uh, way in which UN agencies work. Uh, like the, the, each of them has their own way of looking at data or looking at the challenges and uh, bringing them together to do a report together uh, was very uh, difficult. But uh, when that was finally uh, agreed to through the appointment of focal points by the heads of agencies, uh, things moved on uh, pretty smoothly. And then the other was the lack of data. And I think the CRD provided some of the data, uh, the crisis dashboard that is, but then you find that uh, some of the, the data in uh, that is provided through that platform is either uh, not updated or it's a, it's incomplete. Uh, and we had uh, situations where the data that we had did not have uh, uh, information, for example, on, uh, on governance. So we had to rely on uh, sources that are civil society led sources of data, which are not recognized by the government. Uh, so sometimes the question of data was uh, was a, a serious uh, challenge to, besides the institutional dynamics. On the UNCT, I think uh, the, the, the best way the, that we found very easy and we didn't struggle with it in Kenya is leveraging the role of the resident coordinator because the resident coordinator uh, calls monthly or quarterly meetings with the UNCT and what we just had to do was uh, request a slot within the UNCT and, uh, and uh, offer uh, the analysis. So it became a part of the regular UNCT uh, meetings. And in terms of programmatic uh, support, uh, we relied on uh, resource areas that, uh, for example, UNDP and other agencies have already created. Uh, so that we are not uh, creating uh, another layer of, uh, of reporting and partnership. So we leveraged on existing uh, networks and, uh, and uh, working relationships. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Priska. And, and I'm sure we're all glad to hear that um, the repositioned UNDS is actually working and, and you have the support of the RC and you can rely on that established process without having to build new mechanisms. So that, that's great. Um, Dil Rukshi, same questions for you, but of course at the at the regional level, biggest challenge you've experienced thus far, and and um, I mean also also at the regional level, how how you brought in this integration um, dimension. Two minutes, please. Okay, so I think the challenge. I mean the whole uh, silos. It, it's a couple of different ways. It's institutional. It's a humanitarian development and peace silos. But I, I think sometimes we forget there's also uh, thematic silos. 
um, to, to the way uh, certain issues are, are, are worked on. And, and I think that that can be a, a, a challenge as well. I mean, you look at an issue like climate, uh, climate security, um, climate change work traditionally has always sat very comfortably in kind of environment disaster risk reduction portfolios within the UN and, and then how do you take an issue like that and make sure that the discourse moves to looking at it for its peace and security and governance implications. So bringing in um, and broadening that discourse that there is a climate peace and security discourse now that we need to continue to kind of percolate, um, uh, you know, and, and moving it out of maybe the programmatic teams and frameworks um, and broadening that up to be more broadly owned. So I would say that's, that's, that's a challenge and it applies for many issues, the way we work on digital transformation and the intersections between the work we do on digitalization, et cetera, regulatory governance, et cetera, and digital harm like hate speech. I think those interconnections are, are important and it remains a challenge. And I think the sec, I mean, I think evidence and analysis is really important because I think if you use as the PDAs so do so well, um, identifying strategic pieces of analysis and evidence that they can introduce into the UN planning frameworks or introduce into the way the, the UN country teams work. Um, and we really need to help translate what that analysis means. It's not good enough to stop there, but really what are the implications on development for, for on conflict and really having that relationship with the UN country teams to be able to sit down and say, this is what it means for your beneficiary targeting in an agriculture project, or you know, this is what it will mean for, for a, an anti-corruption project, et cetera. Translating the evidence into its implications um, on development uh, would be uh, a way to overcome that challenge. Thank you so much, Dil. That was great. Um, colleagues, we're three minutes to the end of our segment, and I really do not want to keep us beyond 10 o'clock. Um, I was monitoring the chat, and I see that we had, we've had we had a couple of comments, um, one from Sari Pali, who mentions that good constitution, educating uh, on civic responsibility, sensitive impartial police, abiding constitution and justice department may be essential for good civil society to prosper. Social silos are also essential tools, educating in digital transformation, very essential. I know there was an earlier comment from Andres Shamba who mentioned that uh, HDP Nexus and SDGs do pose a challenge, mainly around humanitarian principles and those of development work. Now I'm gonna look through again to see if anyone um, wants to take 30 seconds to share a perspective or um, there's a there's a raised hand, Emily Knowles. Where's Emily? Yes, Emily, you have the floor. 30 seconds. Thank you. I won't use them all, I promise. I was just wondering whether you guys had any practical advice as to how we can best loop into to your work and to your network. Um, I sit within the resident representatives office in UNDP Niger. Um, we're trying to get a better way of doing our conflict analysis, conflict sensitivity. We're trying to work towards getting more of a shared conflict analysis within the country and also within the regional office from, from Dakar. I'd be really interested in whether you have any thoughts about how best we can tie PDA network and the work that you're doing and where you've seen it work well before in the past so that we can take that to our own context. But thanks, I appreciate that's a challenge in 30 seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. I'm going to ask Dil Rukshi to respond in 10 seconds to that question. I know you can do it. Dil, over. I mean, hi, Emily. I think, you know, we, it is the UNDP DPPA John program and the PDAs of, you know, are of service to the UN country team. And in my region, for sure, PDAs are very, very involved in kind of supporting conflict analysis with the broader UNCT level, but also supporting, you know, UNDP in, in, in its kind of more programmatic uh, driven analysis. It, no one, no size fits all, um, but there, this, this regular 
regular engagement with the PDAs is, 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 is what I found really works with PDAs who regularly, for example, will meet with the UNDP governance team or with the UNDP RR um, and, and really kind of take that, that, that process forward. I'm happy to share more um, and we can connect offline. Thank you so much, Dil. You see, you did it. That was excellent. Thank you. Colleagues, I have to say this has been so rich, so informative, including for me. I've learned a lot. It's been amazing. Please do not let the conversation end here. We are, we are an initiative that is meant to connect each other and strengthen our collective capacities around this integration work in various dimensions, peace, development, and so on. And so Information about our keynote speakers today is available on Spark Blue. Um, so you can reach out to them, write to them if you have any questions, if you wanna keep the conversation going on what we've heard today. You can see that the work that the PDAs are doing and the regional, represent the regional um, specialists are really incredible, relevant, very tangible, but also very critical for where we are right now in the world with all of the poly crises, with the record number of conflicts. This is a space that the UN system must navigate and must strengthen capacities to be able to meaningfully support governments and countries achieve peace, prevent conflict and ultimately achieve our sustainable development objectives. So um, thank you, a big, big thank you to our keynote speakers for taking out the time sharing with us the work that you do. We have learned so much from you. Thank you very much to all of the participants who stayed with us for the full hour. It's been brilliant. A big thank you to Nadine behind the scenes, who's organizing everything and making this happen along with her team and to colleagues and founding members of the IPPN. Thanks for keeping the IPPN alive. Um, please um, be on the lookout for subsequent IPPN knowledge cafes. If you wanna be a speaker, or a participant in a different way, do feel free to reach out to us and we're, we're happy to always collaborate. Um, another cafe, another webinar will be coming up soon. You'll get that information. It is 10.02, so I apologize for keeping us two minutes over time. I'm Kiki Didigu from UNFPA. Thank you so much. And our session is closed. Have a good day. Thank you so much. All right. Bye everyone. Thank you.